Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's January 27th. Today, we celebrate the king whose dream castle incorporated 1,200 varieties of tulips and the man who's regarded as the greatest channeler of the English rural landscape. We'll learn about the mathematician who wrote a book inspired by the Oxford Botanic Garden and the relatively young botanic garden that was started in the 90s for the Northern California region. Today's unearthed words feature a beloved American poet who wrote a poem about flowers in winter. And we grow that garden library with a book that dives deep into the behind the scenes of Sissinghurst, sharing all of Vita's plant choices and how she created her masterpiece. I'll talk about a garden item that can help you keep your phone clean and usable during the garden season. No more dirty or smudged screens. And then we'll wrap things up with the anniversary of an important antibiotic discovery from a soil sample taken in the great state of Indiana. But first, let's catch up on a few recent events. Here's today's curated articles. First up is a post about moths and butterflies from the website discoverwildlife.com. New research is showing that insect symmetrical patterns have evolved to become less obvious to predators. This is a great post that was written by Christina Turner, and she points out right away that butterflies and moths have bilateral symmetrical camouflage. In other words, their body can be divided along a midline, and the pattern is a mirror image on each side. Previous studies have shown that the closer the symmetry is to the midline, the more visible it is to predators. And that's a problem for butterflies and moths. But in this new study, scientists are beginning to understand that insects are actually reducing this symmetry by shifting their patterns away from the midline, thereby reducing the noticeability of the symmetry. This fascinating article on camouflage for butterflies and moths can be found in the Facebook group for the show just by searching for the word symmetry, and this post will pop right up. Next up is a post from John Walker that was featured in Hartley Magazine. Walker is an award-winning gardening and environment writer. His latest book is The New Edition of Weeds, an organic, earth-friendly guide to their identification, use, and control. John's post talks about growing carnivorous plants, something he had never done because he didn't want to use peat. Then he stumbled on a tweet by David Morris, a senior reserves ecologist, and his tweet was showing a cobra lily with the delightful Latin name Darlingtonia californica. The image caught John's attention, and he did a double take when he saw the hashtag Pete Free. John wrote, Carnivorous plants grown without nature-wrecking peat mined from drained, carbon-unlocking sphagnum bogs? Surely not. But there it was, the cobra lily growing happily in a clay pot with not an ounce of peat in sight. John points out that for many years, the carnivorous plant growing mantra was that you had to use sphagnum peat-based compost in order to be successful. But recently, specialist carnivorous plant growers and gardeners are experimenting with peat-free mixes, and they're having great success. As for David Morris, he grows his carnivorous plants in a mix. He uses equal parts Melcourt Growbark Pine, Perlite, and Lime-Free Grit. 
This mixture is open and encourages draining. It's light and allows for extensive root growth. And John notices that there's virtually no moss that's growing on the compost surface. If you want to read more of John's article called For the Love of Peat, Growing Carnivorous Plants in a Peat-Free Environment, just search for Peat in the Facebook group for the show and John's post will pop right up. Now, if you'd like to check out these curated articles for yourself, you're in luck because I share all of it in the listener community for the show. It's a free Facebook group and it's called the Daily Gardener Community. So there's no need to track down links or take notes. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community and request to join and then I'll admit you and I'll see you in the group. And then you'll have access to all of these articles. They'll show up in your Facebook feed amongst beautiful pictures of your friends and family. You can also jump into the group at any time and share pictures from your own garden, ask questions, share poetry, and so forth. And just a reminder, everything I share in the group is curated with you in mind, There's no spam and it's 100% free. And once again, it's called the Daily Gardener Community. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the German king, Karl Wilhelm von Baden-Durlach, who was born on this day in 1679. In 1715, Karl founded the city Karlsruhe, or Karl's Repose, after he actually had a dream about building the city. At Karl's castle in Durlach, there was a large flower garden, and it had nearly 1,200 varieties of tulips. The king was a fan of them, and he also had over 7,000 orange trees. In 1738, Carl died while he was working in his tulip bed. After his death, the Karlsruhe Pyramid was installed over his grave. And today is the birthday of the English painter, etcher, and printmaker, Samuel Palmer, who was born on this day in 1805. Samuel Palmer is regarded as the greatest artist of the English rural landscape. Palmer's landscapes exude a strong connection with the land and with nature. Samuel was one of the lead members of an artist group called the Ancients, who followed the visionary artist William Blake in the final years before his death in 1827. The Ancients often expressed their work with a mystical view of nature. For instance, Samuel painted trees as if they had individual personalities. It was Samuel Palmer who said, The visions of the soul being perfect are the only true standard by which nature must be tried. With regard to the garden, Samuel built a studio for himself in his garden, and he would access it by exiting the house through a secret door that looked like a bookcase. Today is the birthday of the English mathematician and writer Charles Lutwidge Dodgson, who was also known as Lewis Carroll. He was born on this day in 1832. Lewis had worked as a librarian at Christ Church College in Oxford. His office window had a view to the Dean's Garden below. Lewis wrote in his diary on the 25th of April in 1856 that he had visited the deanery garden where he was planning to take pictures of the cathedral. Instead, he ended up taking pictures of children in the garden. The children were allowed in the deanery garden 
but not in the cathedral garden, which was connected to the deanery garden by a door. The Oxford Botanic Garden inspired Lewis Carroll to write Alice in Wonderland. The same garden also inspired the authors J.R.R. Tolkien and Philip Pullman. In Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass is this favorite passage among gardeners. In most gardens, the tiger lily said, they make the beds too soft so that the flowers are always asleep. Today is the National Geographic Society's anniversary. It was officially incorporated on this day in 1888. The National Geographic Society was founded by a group of elite scholars, explorers, and scientists. National Geographic celebrates the power of science, exploration, education, and storytelling. It was founded to increase and diffuse geographic knowledge while promoting the conservation of the world's cultural, historical, and natural resources. It was Jane Goodall who said, Only if we understand will we care. Only if we care will we help. And only if we help shall all be saved. It was on this day in 1992 that the Humboldt Botanical Garden was incorporated in the state of California. It was organized by a small group of volunteers, and the goal was to create an educational botanical garden for the Northern California region. The Humboldt Botanical Gardens are constructed on a 45 and a half acre site south of Eureka near the Humboldt Bay and adjacent to the College of the Redwoods. In Unearthed Words, here's a poem from the American poet John Greenleaf Whittier called Flowers in Winter. Whittier was a Quaker. He was a staunch abolitionist and a great lover of nature. Here's Flowers in Winter from John Greenleaf Whittier. How strange to greet this frosty morn in graceful counterfeit of flowers. These children of the meadows born of sunshine and of showers. A wizard of the Merrimack, so old ancestral legends say, could call green leaf and blossom back to frosted stem and spray. The settler saw his oaken flail take bud and bloom before his eyes. From frozen pools, he saw the pale, sweet summer lilies rise. The beechen platter sprouted wild. The pipkin wore its old-time green. The cradle over the sleeping child became a leafy screen. And while the dew on leaf and flower glistened in moonlight, clear and still, learned the dusk wizard's spell of power and caught his trick of skill. The one with bridal blush of rose and sweetest breath of woodland balm, and one whose matron lips unclose in smiles of saintly calm. Fill soft and deep, O oh winter snow, the sweet azalea's oaken dells, and hide the bank where roses blow and swing the azure bells. Overlay the amber violet's leaves, the purple aster's brookside home. Guard all the flowers her pencil gives, a life beyond their bloom. And she, when spring comes round again, by greening slope and singing flood, shall wander seeking not in vain her darlings of the wood. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, 
Sissinghurst by Vita Sackville West and Sarah Raven. The subtitle to this book is Vita Sackville West and the Creation of a Garden. The British poet and writer Vita Sackville West wrote a weekly column in The Observer where she shared her life at Sissinghurst. Sarah culled through all of those articles in addition to a number of family documents. Sarah happens to be married to Vita's grandson, Adam Nicholson. And who better than Sarah Raven to write this extraordinary book, and to share with us Vita's love of flowers and gardening. Every year, gardeners and non-gardeners alike visit Sissinghurst for inspiration and enjoyment. In fact, Sissinghurst remains one of the most visited gardens in the world. Sarah's book is loaded with beautiful photographs and drawings that help convey the triumph of this special place for gardeners and lovers of beauty. Gardeners will especially appreciate the level of detail regarding almost every plant in the garden, why they were chosen, and Vita's personal take on each plant. Vita's plant lists are part of her legacy, and they're a gift to gardeners who want to model her gorgeous plant combinations. You can get a used copy of Sissinghurst by Vita Sackville West and Sarah Raven and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for under $12. And here's today's great gift for gardeners. It's a 10-pack of stylus pins by Lieberway. They come in all different colors, pink, purple, black, green, and silver, and they have universal touch screen capacity. They're about three and a half inches long, and they're a great little item for your garden tote. Just slip them in your garden apron, put them in your shed or garage, keep one in your purse, pocket, or in your truck. And then when you need to use your phone and you're working in the garden and you have your gloves on, you won't need to remove your gloves or wash your hands in order to use your phone. These styluses have a better touch point than the tip of your finger, so you get better accuracy and you don't have to worry about scratching your screen. And since they come in a 10-pack, you can certainly share some of them with your friends and family and still have plenty left for you. Best of all, these styluses come with a one-year warranty, and they fit all kinds of touchscreens, whether you're using an iPhone or a Samsung or a Kindle. You can get the 10-pack of styluses and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for $6.98. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today, in 1950, Science Magazine announced a brand new antibiotic made by Charles Pfizer and Company, and it was called Teramycin. Pfizer and Company was a small chemical company in 1950, and it was based in Brooklyn, New York. The company developed an expertise in fermentation with citric acid. The method allowed them to mass produce drugs. When Pfizer scientists discovered an antibiotic in a soil sample from Indiana, their deep tank fermentation method allowed them to mass produce teramycin. Pfizer had been searching through soil samples from around the world, isolating bacteria-fighting organisms when they stumbled on teramycin, found to be effective against pneumonia, dysentery, and other infections. Later in 1950, it was approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. The name teramycin is created from two Latin words, terra for earth and mycin, 
which means fungus. Thus, earth fungus. Teramycin was the first mass-marketed product by a pharmaceutical company. Pfizer spent twice as much marketing teramycin as it did on R&D. The gamble paid off. Teramycin, earth fungus, made Pfizer a pharmaceutical powerhouse. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced weekdays in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. You can find complete show notes over at thedailygardener.org. And be sure to share the show with your garden friends. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest, and of course, Facebook. While you're over at Facebook, don't forget to join The Daily Gardener community. Just search for these three words, Daily Gardener community. The group will pop right up and then request to join. Finally, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, where my fabulous editor is Eric Begay. Have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.